Good afternoon. My name is Aaron Stam, and I'm the UF IFAS Extension Agent for the Seminole Tribe of Florida. And this afternoon, I'm going to give you a presentation on what exactly is a controlled breeding or calving season. And uh, so I'm going to try and keep this as brief as possible, as I know it's a, on an online format, and uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I will say that my contact information is uh, A as in Aaron and then Stam, S-T-A-M at ufl.edu, or you can reach me on my cell, 863-458-6146. That's 863-458-6146. And feel free to give me a call with any thoughts or questions that you might have. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll get this PowerPoint up and rolling. All right, so what exactly is a controlled breeding season? It's when the bulls are separated from the cow herd except for just a designated period of time. And then this creates a specific period when all calves will be born. Um, different producers have different uh, opinions about calving seasons. Uh, a lot of folks are still using uh, 120, 180 days, but research has shown that a breeding season of 90 days typically has the most desirable outcomes as far as weaning weights uh, in uniform calves. But as the slide says, any system is better than no system at all. And what specifically we're referring to there is that means bulls being in year round. Um, an overview, things that I'm gonna cover. Um, the advantages and disadvantages of a controlled breeding season, the impacts on animal health, the impacts on weaning weights, uh, impacts on labor costs. And then we're gonna talk briefly about one person's uh, or a, a plan to convert, uh, if you're using year round breeding right now, how you could convert to a 90 day um, breeding season in just a couple of years. Goals of a cow calf producer, um, and that is for your cow to have a calf every year. Um, one of the things I fear for folks that have year round breeding season is that their calving intervals might reach 15 months or 18 months, and they're actually losing 25 to 50% of that cow's production value because she's not truly bringing a calf to the pens every year. Um, we'd like higher weaning weights. We'd like higher selling prices to increase our income. And uh, all cow-calf producers are looking at keeping inputs and costs and expenses low. Um, some of the goals of a Florida cow-calf producer, these are lofty goals on this slide, but I think all obtainable. Um, most producers are looking to have cow pregnancy rates in the 95%. Again, that's a, that's a high number, but very attainable. Um, heifer pregnancy rate of 85% with an abortion rate of less than three. Dystocia rate is less than 5% for cows and less than 10% on heifers. Uh, I'd like to see it even lower than that, but uh, we know what happens. A stillbirth rate of less than 2%, um, a birth to weaning loss of less than 5%, less than a 1% cow mortality rate. And then with the cows, we're looking at uh, goals being an average daily gain of greater than two and a half pounds per day. And at 205 days old, that they're weighing 50% of their mother's weight as well as a 90% weaned live calf crop. So we'll move on. Um, main reasons for not having a controlled breeding season. Many producers feel that they're actually going to have fewer calves if the bull isn't allowed to be with their cows year round. They feel that they can breed more cows to a bull by breeding year round. Um, many producers feel that it's too much trouble to uh, create a pasture and can find those bulls during their off season. Uh, the other thing that we hear from a lot of folks is that producers want to have income coming in year round. And that's very understandable. That's, that's a good thing. But ultimately, I believe that you can get more money through a controlled breeding season. Um, what are some of the disadvantages of a controlled breeding season? You do have expenses. And so this talks about the cost of fence materials for the bull pasture, but there's more to it than that. There's going to, you're going to need water structures. You're going to need um, supplement and labor um, and molasses uh, or 
whatever you're providing your supplements in, as well as shade and things that uh, the infrastructures that make a pasture work. Um, the other disadvantage for most people is that that income uh, source is, is generated to either once or twice a year. And so for a lot of folks, having a one-time event where their income comes in just doesn't work well for them. And, uh, and I certainly understand that. Um, reasons for a controlled breeding season. And I think there are some major factors that we need to look at. The first being that nutrition can be adjusted according to the physiological status of the cow. And so for a lot of folks that look at body condition scores of their cattle, um, you can feed 60 to 90 days before the bull comes in and get that body condition score trending in the right direction. Um, it really helps the, that cow's chances of becoming pregnant um, as, as the bulls are first come in. Um, cattle can also be closely observed for calving difficulty. Again, many of us on, on some of the larger facilities, that's a hard thing to do. But if the smaller the window of your calving season, the easier it is to observe. Um, calf crop can be more uniform in, um, in age and weight for marketing purposes. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that soon. Um, facilitation of management. And so that everything from um, working your animals, from vaccinating, castration, earmarking, um, all of that's easier to coordinate when it's all those calves are falling in um, to a smaller window. And then finally, the identification of reproductively unsound cattle. And that means culling open females that um, without a timed uh, or a controlled breeding season, the, the being able to recognize those sub fertile females gets harder. And so much easier to do when you see that cow doesn't have a calf with her. Um, some more reasons why you should have a controlled calving season, if I haven't sold you on it already, but you can provide better care for your animals at calving time. Um, preg checking is simplified for your veterinarian. It allows, um, most folks can, with a controlled breeding season, can have a vet come in and, uh, and preg check those animals. Um, and you know what your calf crop or have a good idea of where your calf crop is going to be. Herd health care and management are simplified allows you to make some decisions as far as supplements and feed um, to tailor towards uh, the, that breeding season. The culling of cows and selection of replacement heifers can be based on performance records. And again, um, there are lots of different ways to keep records on these animals, uh, but, but not having a uniform calving season makes it much harder to keep um, keep tabs on who is having a calf and when. And finally, it says brood cow nutrition is improved. Um, and certainly that can be done in a variety of ways by um, looking at the, the proper feed or times to feed those animals before the breeding season begins. And then usually 30 to 60 days after the bulls go in, some folks like to keep that feed out. Female reproductive performance, um, heifers that are mated too early, that nine to 10 months old, uh, where I work, the, the tribe primarily breeds two-year-old heifers. Um, lots of folks breed yearlings, but um, if those yearlings are bred too early before they're fully, um, they're fully ready for breeding, um, you can have increased in dystocia. Those animals might miss their second pregnancy it can lead to, which leads to malnutrition for calf and the heifer. Um, young size, young age and size may lead to obviously multiple calving problems and uh, a controlled calving season um, eliminates problems by exposing bulls, I'm sorry, exposing the females to bulls at the appropriate time. And uh, a lot of those things you can just track a little bit more closely when you've only got to deal with that bull being out there for three months a year. So this slide is some of the research that Dr. Alan Warnick did in uh, the 50s and 60s at UF, and uh, he published it in 1973. And I think it's pretty significant that I actually have this slide up on my door at work, and it's just a, to, a conversation starter for some folks that walk into my office, but um, it 
pregnancy, <coughs> his, his study pulled all open females. So anything that wasn't bred, he got rid of. And it had a massive effect on um, not only the percentage of his herd that was pregnant, but on the weaning weights of those animals as well. So the very first year of his study, 44% of his cows were pregnant. The average weaning weight of those calves were 450 pounds. He then culled 56% of his herd that was open. They all went away. Um, the second year, he increased his pregnancy percentage by 11 points and weaning weight went up 65 pounds. The third year, he took another huge jump um, of 27 points. It went up um, pretty significantly to 82% of the herd was pregnant and his weaning weight went up to 432 pounds. So within three years, he nearly doubled the pregnancy rate in his herd and added 82 pounds onto his weaning weight. Uh, pretty exceptional. Uh, and obviously he's lost a fair number of cows during that time frame, but he's seeing more production out of his herd. Um, and I believe a higher weaning weight as he's reduced his subfertile females that he had in the pasture. And then you can see right through the 1960 and 64, his percent of pregnancy continued to go up as well as his weaning weights continued to rise. Um, very simply, if females do not bring a calf to your pens, they need to be cold. And I know that uh, several folks say, well, we give them one shot. And I understand they're, they're, they're bound to miss um, at some point. But I've talked to others who say, uh, you know, hey, we'll, we'll give them a second shot because she, she looked good. And um, I understand the mindset. It's hard to get rid of some of those females, but after they've missed two calves, um, it becomes very economically hard for her to ever pay herself back. And by the time that she's missed three, two, three calves, um, she cannot make you money. She's gonna be a net income loss for you. Bull health. Um, bulls need to have a health check prior to being turned down. Most people that have a bull pasture have some sort of a nutrition plan in place, um, but they need to be conditioned prior to the season. Um, all bulls should have a breedness, breeding soundness exam prior to the breeding season. And so um, for most vets that come out, they're gonna do a semen check as well as make sure that that bull is in good shape so that he can cover the ground and cover the cows. Um, the bull to cow ratio should be around one bull to 25 cows. Um, if your bull does not pass the soundness exam, there is no reason to keep him around unless Really, I, I can't think of a great one. There, there might be a few in purebred situations that, um, or if he suffered from malnutrition, but if he doesn't pass, he should be cold. Um, and I like to think about bulls in a way that they are an athlete and uh, you need them to perform like a high-end athlete, but they also need to have a libido. And, uh, and so they've got to have that desire to get out and make you money. I don't think that guy was doing it. Um, we know that calving time is the greatest economic influence on a cow-calf operation. And so increasing your weaning weights and herd pregnancy percentage is going to make you more money. Um, when we look at weaning weights, we know that without a controlled breeding season, calves will vary in age and weight and likely their management, reducing in less money, less income coming to the ranch. Research indicates that the number of calves born during the summer months, regardless of age, have the lightest weaning weight. So um, talk a little bit about that here shortly, but we know that in the summertime, the heat, insects, parasites, and water um, make calving in Florida in the summer a, a pretty rough thing to do. As we look at this chart, um, there's a lot of good data on that. And we're looking at basically the 205 day adjusted weights of calves born in different months. And you can see that JFM, January, February, and March, those animals were up over 475 pounds. <clears throat> we decline through April, a um, little rebound in July, but then basically continue to decline all the way through September. And those numbers start to come back up through Oknov and Beast. So um, we see that fall calving having a, a big impact on weaning weights. Now, you do have options. You don't have to market those calves the, the day that they're weaned. 
Um, lots of folks are looking at feeding and preconditioning um, and we're early weaning to, uh, especially on your heifers. So there are a lot of options that are out there uh, as far as getting those animals off of the, the cow. Long calving seasons, more than 90 days, often result in a wide range of age of calves at weaning time. And we see those younger animals at lighter weights um, really starts to impact your pocketbook as your average weaning weight decreases. Now, with a uniform calf crop, if you've got a, a good controlled season, uh, a uniform calf crop is important because you are going to have a uniform load both on size and weight, um, which will typically bring a premium. If you're someone who brings their calves to the sale barn, uh, remember that even at the sale barn, those, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, there are order buyers sitting at the sale barn and they're looking to fill semis and they wanna buy uniform calves. So uniform calves are gonna ultimately bring you more money at the market as well. Uh, this chart shows a little bit or starts to talk about the age of the calf and compares that to its weaning weight. We can see 80 days, basically through 140 days, um, that animal is right around that 300 pound mark. And as we start to bump that up, 100, 140 days to 180, we start getting around that 400 pound range. Um, and really what we were looking at, what this study showed was that the, the best results that they were finding as far as um, calves were going was right around that 240 to 260 day um, time frame they were weaning those animals around 500 pounds. Much after that, those calves um, started to compete with their mothers for forage and supplements. And then you, folks really have to start looking at adjusting their stocking rate um, or feed levels to make sure that those cows are able to perform at the way that they want them in, um, not, not reduce the, the cow's body score to a point where she may not reproduce the following year. <coughs> Excuse me again. Nutrition, controlled breeding season allows you to meet the nutritional needs of each cow more efficiently. Uh, I'm a believer that a lot of these uh, cattle need to be fed um, for a short period of time before the bulls go in if their body condition score has fallen off. Uh, that can be a management strategy, everything as far as fertilization to rotation, um, the forage quality is pretty, pretty, pretty significant as far as keeping the body condition scores high on those cattle. Um, but if you have a controlled season, you're able to address that uh, more consistently. All calves are, can also be weaned on the same date, which again, allows you to start them on the feed um, or any sort of a backgrounding program on the same day. We pulled some numbers up and uh, looked at the cattle that were born on a 60 day calving period versus a 90 day calving period versus a 120 day calving period and the average weaning weights, as the period got longer, the average weaning weight decreased. So the 60 day weaning or the 60 day calving period, the average weaning weight was 410 pounds. The 120 day calving period dropped by, uh, dropped by 40 pounds. And, uh, and so what we ultimately saw was that that 90 day calving period with a 390 pound weaning weight was kind of the optimum time. And we didn't have too many females fall out of the cycle um, due to culling with a, a shortened 60 day calving period. Labor costs, um, as you move to a controlled breeding season, your labor costs will actually decrease. You can be more efficient in your work days, more efficient in your feeding, preg check. Um, you're gonna start to reduce the overall cost associated with maintaining your herd. Controlled breeding and calving offers better utilization of labor and coordination of management practices. And again, that can be everything as far as from earmarking to castration, dehorning, vaccination, all the things that you're gonna do when you work your cows, um, it lets you get it done at the same time. And uh, a good hand at going at $175 a day, um, the number of days that you can afford um, to keep your cow pens full of day laborers is really up to you, but we know we all like to keep our costs low. Now, if you don't have a breeding season right now, um, how can you convert to 
to a breeding, a controlled breeding season. And the first thing that would be recommended is that uh, you need a place to take those bulls and keep them safe and out of the cow herd. So building a good, strong bull pasture um, would be where you begin. Remove the bulls from the herd and select the last date you want your calves born. Um, 60 days after removing your bulls, you can pregnancy check those cows and pull whatever is open. So you're looking to remove any of the open, dry breeding age females, and then any of your cows that have calves that are five or that are open with calves that are five months or older. That first year, those bulls can go back in for a six month breeding season. So that's gonna give you six months um, of calving period. Now, if you have replacement heifers that you're gonna have in that herd, uh, we'd recommend that those heifers get bred 20 to, or have bulls put in with them 20 to 30 days ahead of the cows. Um, then the, the cows get the bulls out with them for the six months. In the second year of this program, you can reduce the six month breeding season to four to four and a half months. And then hopefully by that third year, you're able to reduce your breeding season to 90 days. That slide says 80 to 90, but again, we've seen 90 days producing the most optimal um, performance out of um, the calves. Uh, and it says, don't forget to call all open cows while preg checking. Uh, that's a, again, a huge factor in increasing your weaning weight and herd conception. Which, when should you have your, your calving season? Uh, again, in South Florida, uh, summer, summer is not a good time. So um, this one, this slide says summer calving requires one word of advice, don't. Uh, I think it's, there's some interesting conversations that can be explored about calving seasons in South Florida or in Florida in general, but uh, that's, a, that's a topic for another day. Um, the best option for Florida is fall and winter calving. We saw that on the slide earlier where our weaning weights were definitely improved through the fall and winter months. And uh, we, we see a, a better market price on those calves than the spring born calves. Bottom line, if you don't have your bulls out of your herd, how will you know which females are truly open? How many, which of those females are bringing a calf to the pen every 12 months or 15 months or 18 months? You could be losing 25 to 50% of your production um, simply because the breeding season had been extended or your calving interval had been extended to uh, 15 to 18 months. Um, we also believe that marketing is more profitable when cows, when calves are grouped by size and age. And uh, that's all I have for this afternoon's presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you learned something and I didn't take up too much of your time. Again, I encourage you to uh, reach out with any questions you might have to astam at ufl.edu or call myself 863-458-6146. I wanna thank you for um, being here and hope that you're all safe and healthy. Take care. Mm -hmm.